if we were profitable, what would you do with that money? If we didn't invest back in hiring more people to continue to make the company more solid, you have to say like, would you just take that money out and pay yourself a lot of money as the founder? Our company has like a value today. And if I can dump every extra dollar that the company makes back into the company getting bigger, then that value will be much higher in the future. Hey, hey, good WordPress people. Welcome back to the WPMRR WordPress podcast. I'm Joe. And I'm Qui-Gon. And you're listening to the WordPress Business Pi podcast. You, We've got Qui-Gon on the pod this week. Great pick, old school pick. Uh, I, Star Wars fan, any reason you went with Qui-Gon on this week? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the, it's funny, we tried to explain it for kids, the newer which really the original versions or the original kind of in the series. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think he's really one of the like cornerstone of how the rest of the evolution went. So yeah, that's why I picked him. Yeah, totally. You know, I was actually talking with someone recently about episode one and a lot of people regard episode one as like one of the not so good episodes. And I think there were aspects of episode one that were like really not good. Like Jar Jar Binks is like the big ones. Like, wow, that episode was bad or that movie was bad but a lot of it's just because like that was a pretty bad addition to like the whole uh star wars universe but i always say star wars episode one i think has the best lightsaber fighting the best lightsaber choreography out of all of the star wars movies i've ever seen so yeah. i thought that was super badass so i love qui-gon as a character so yeah uh, nice yeah. pick we've got uh, qui-gon uh, on the pod this week also known as craig hewitt so craig uh welcome to the podcast thanks for being on why don't you tell folks a little bit about what you do this is like a wordpress podcast but this is totally in the realm of like wordpress and just podcasting and, and digital things growing an audience stuff so why don't you tell folks a little bit more about what you do yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Joe, thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, my name is Craig Hewitt. I'm the founder of Castos. We're a cast hosting analytics and production company. And we also are the kind of owners and managers of the seriously simple podcasting WordPress plugin. Uh, and so at Castos, we do podcast hosting. Uh, so just kind of storage and distribution of files to listeners, um, as well as kind of give folks insights about who their audience is and where they're coming from and kind of what they're what they're liking and not liking about podcasts. We also have a professional services arm that does podcast editing and production for about 80 customers at this point. Yeah, that is super cool. We've got a, um, a company that does something similar for us. Um, that, that is it really what you should just kind of be Bradley and he's kind of grown out his company a little bit, but it's like, I drop my podcast. <clears throat> the recording's coming to here in the riverside.fm and then they're just like magically published, you know, every Tuesday. Yeah. And that's great for me because I'm a not an audio engineer, nor do I really want to learn how to do that, nor am I <laughs> probably really good at it. So that kind of stuff is super helpful for me. Um and yeah, seriously, a uh, simple WordPress plugin uh as well. Um is that kind of has it always been part of Castos or did it like join the Castos family? Yeah, so I it, that's kind of the origin of the whole the whole business. So I guess to kind of take two steps back, I guess. So so my first business as like a digital entrepreneur was Podcast Motor. So it's this what is now Castos Productions kind of a professional services arm done for you audio engineering, show note writing, marketing assets, publishing. So just like you're saying, Joe, folks record episodes, stick them in Dropbox. Uh, a week later, they show up in uh, in Apple Podcasts. That's how I got kind of got started. Mm -hmm. uh, and then through that, um, one of our customers there, actually, Brad Tunard from Delicious Brains, I'm sure most folks listening to this know, know of Brad and Delicious Brains, uh, introduced me to someone who was the kind of creator and previous owner of the Seriously Simple Podcasting plugin. He said, hey, Hugh Lashbrook, a guy that wrote the plugin, uh, is joining the audience and kind of wants to divest himself of the plugin so he can focus more on his community management efforts at Automatic. And, uh, you know, hey, know you're in the podcasting space. Know you've wanted to get into a software product. The plugin at that time was was entirely free and not monetized at all. And so mm -hmm. we acquired the plugin. That was kind of the genesis of Casta. So the whole kind of all along was the idea was, you know, acquire the plugin, add the hosting arm onto it uh, as an optional kind of upsell or add-on for folks who who want to manage their podcast from WordPress, but don't want to have to fuss with a Libsyn or a whatever else that they're kind of weirdly bolting on. It's all very natively integrated into WordPress. Yeah, cool. Um, so I, I think 
I think I originally wanted to have you on the podcast because I think a WP Tavern article came out that said like Castos is growing pretty significantly. I think it said something like 300% growth of like users or or new podcasts started. I can't remember the exact statistic, but it was something like that using Castos I don't know if it was hosting or just the entire infrastructure, everything you're talking about around podcasting, yeah. but it sounds like you've had kind of a lot of growth during COVID times. I, I I was interested in learning a little bit more about that because I didn't know if it was, you have more insight into the growth than anybody else does, obviously. So I'd be interested to hear, was it, are you seeing more folks just like starting podcasts, like normal people, non-business people just saying like, I want to start a podcast or is it more um, like people switching over from like other host podcast hosting coming over to Castos? Like where is that growth coming from? Yeah, I think it's coming a little bit from everywhere. So we definitely get folks coming from other platforms. I mean, there are, you know, fortunately and unfortunately are a lot of options out there. Uh, some of them are very, very good. Some of them uh, are, are not as good. And folks say, hey, I need more options. Um, I need more functionality, I need things that can extend my podcast and think, do things like natively integrate into my WordPress site so that I can manage my content more easily. And so we do get a, a lot of folks coming over and we make that process pretty easy for yeah. them with like automatic and things like that. <laughs> but like you're alluding to, we also see a lot of people and especially brands and businesses and people that want to have brands say, I can't go to conferences anymore. I can't do trade shows. I can't even go see my sales prospects in person. Mm. You know, kind of, we have to do something else. <laughs> we already have a blog. A podcast is the next, you know, most logical option. And so I think we see a lot of people uh, coming in there. And then, you know, to boot, depending on kind of where you are, um, things like paid advertising in the marketing realm have gotten very expensive. Um, with the advent of COVID and people's kind of buying and shopping patterns changing a lot. And so people look at the the kind of evergreen value of content marketing and podcasting being a form of that as a really good investment. And so I think we're we're very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time uh, when it comes to COVID is, is to say like, we have a what I think is a great product, something that a lot of folks want, and we're making it easy for folks to, to come in and get started. Um, all of those things together uh, are, I think, contributing to our growth because it is weirdly kind of across the board. Yeah, totally. Um, just a quick note, your video is going a little bit in and out because of internet bandwidth stuff. Don't worry about it. We have the, we have a local um, uploads that are happening, so it'll cool. all be good. So if, your video, yeah, okay. if you see your video off, don't worry about it. It's all good. Um, okay. But I wanted no, to touch good. on what you said about digital companies now because I think, yeah, I mean... WP Buff similarly has seen good growth in the last six months or so. I think a lot of like remote companies that are digitally focused have seen a lot of like they've seen a lot of this. It's like a lot of people are starting podcasts. A lot of people are doing more with podcasting. They realize it's something they're not doing. Like now is the perfect time to do it because exactly buying part, um, habits are changing, things like that. WP Buff similarly. A lot of people have WordPress websites. A lot of people are taking their digital um, marketing uh, and everything they do digital more seriously. And that means taking their website more seriously. So a lot of people are like, ah, I got to like grow my traffic. I got to, um, you know, now it's a great time to do that. I want to focus on, you know, sales or, or growing everything digitally, but I don't mm -hmm. want, I, I can't deal with it. I'm not super technical. So I, I need someone to help me with WordPress. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, we're seeing, I think a similar, maybe not the same, same exact thing, but a similar, um, um, similar thing happen. Uh, where we are as well. Are you guys seeing it, it kind of all coming from one place or is it across the board, different kind of different flavors of folks coming in? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's, I think it's different flavors, but I think we're definitely seeing a good amount of small businesses come to mm. us. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because we definitely saw higher churn once COVID hit, because we had a lot of customers who were just saying, you know, my business is maybe not doing so hot right now. I got to cut my costs. Um, I can try to do some of the, this WordPress stuff myself. And, you know, that's fine with us. In fact, we'll, we're for that. If it's going to help you save your business and help you save a few dollars, that's your decision and we'll support that. But we're also seeing a lot of companies that, you know, are fighting against closing that are pushing forward even during this time because maybe they have a little bit more money in the bank that they've saved over the past year or five years um mm -hmm. and they know they need to invest in order to make it through covid uh, or like 
hopefully like be around next year, right? So yeah, yeah. Although we're actually seeing some companies, we saw some companies leaving. Churn was higher, you know, earlier this year. We also saw like super accelerated sa- like sales because a mm-hmm. lot of you know companies that are a little bit more comfortable right now were were coming saying, hey. So uh, it actually all it all kind of worked out. I think we like probably up to the average level of like quality of customer, you know, in the process. So it wasn't, That's wasn't all bad. bad for yeah. Us. Um, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, in pre call notes, just like a little note that you left was like that you're actually not a technical founder. You're a non-technical founder, which I find or, or co-founder. Am I, maybe I got that uh, wrong. Founder. Founder. Yeah, I'm, the founder. I'm the only one. Single, yeah. So yeah, you're actually just like me, a single non-technical <clears throat> Founder of a technical company. Did I say that right? Single, yeah. non-technical founder of a technical company. I'm the same. So I'm always super interested in talking with other folks who are in this position. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about like the early days of Castos. Like, how did it get built in the first place? When you're kind of coming up with all these ideas, here's how what I want to do. Okay, how do I like make this into reality? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you know, it's super tough those early days when you don't have money or customers or even a really, really good idea of what you should build uh, it is really tough. And I, I felt I had several things going for me and it was still really hard. I had going for me um, money from our productized service. So Podcast Motor existed for several years before Casta. And so that allowed me to one fund the development of the Castos platform from Podcast Motor and also pay myself and pay rent and support our family and stuff. Um, gotcha. So I also have been in the podcasting space, probably like you, kind of familiar with the domain that I'm getting into. So there's a less, a lower chance of me kind of totally screwing up and and, and like missing the boat on what we're building. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I think I got really lucky with uh, hiring our first developer who's still with us and is our lead developer, uh, Jonathan Bussinger um, from Cape Town, South Africa, is wonderful and you know came as a recommendation from Hugh Lashbrook that I bought the plugin from. And um, it was really great. I mean, I think that is that is super key. If you're not an experienced founder of a technical product, but but not a technical founder. Um, you need a really strong developer, I think, to say, to kind of hold you accountable, right? Joke is like, you know, us as non-develop, non-technical founders have all these ideas, but have no concept of what it means to build them, you know, and how to talk to developers and how feature in a way that is accurate and representative of what we want, uh, and, and to give them the the grace and the time and the resources that they need to be successful, mm-hmm. and so. I mean, honestly, it is it is still a giant focus of ours to say like, okay, we do pretty good with development, but we could do a lot better. How how can we keep doing better at this whole development cycle uh, process? And we've started we've started implementing a lot of what the base camps folks um, espouse in their shape up book. I don't know if I'm sure folks have kind of read it and we follow it pretty closely. Um, and and it's done a lot to help us really shape and have a well-formed idea before the developers even see it, because I think that's the most dangerous thing is for a non-technical founder to say, Hey, Jonathan, let's go build this integration. And I mean, he he looks at me and says, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you no, know, like you can't, you just can't do that, you know, especially while I'm off in the middle of this other thing. So that that's, I mean, it's, it's been, I think a challenge for everybody. We're in a really good spot now. Um, but I think having a, a strong first developer is, is key there. And I think it's probably a lot of place. A lot of folks make a, uh, an error because they say like, I want to build this SaaS app or I want to build this WordPress plugin or whatever, but I can't mm-hmm. afford a hundred dollar an hour developer. So I'm going to go find really the cheapest person I can. And that yeah. person oftentimes isn't that strong, you know, lead senior developer. And that's, that's where folks get in trouble. I think. Yeah. I, I think that thing you mentioned about having a developer who can push back a little bit on some of your ideas is actually super important as a non-technical founder. Um, even when you're using good methodology to give them, to hand over ideas into something that can be developed or something that can be, you know, coded into something uh, real, 
It's hard though, especially when you're the single founder and there's always a little bit of this dynamic of like, I'm the founder, like I hired you as a developer, I'm paying you your salary or your hourly rate. And yep. like, I, like I want to do this thing. Can we do this thing? And I think there are developers out there who will, you know, say, yes, sir. Or, yes, ma'am. Let's go. Let's do this. This looks great. But I think probably as valuable, if not more valuable, is actually having someone on your team who will push back and ask the right questions and make sure that they understand exactly everything that you are trying to build and things that maybe are red flags or things that they're already thinking ahead, like, ooh, I don't know if this would work. I think that is an enormous value in actually paying someone a higher hourly rate or a more expensive developer because of that. Because if you pay someone, you know, $10 an hour, they'll, they can maybe build an okay version of what you're asking, but they're not going to push back on you probably. But if you hire a more expensive developer, you're probably getting higher quality and you're probably getting someone with more experience. Again, I'm obviously making some assumptions here, but on average, yep. I think you'll probably get someone who will do these things like, hey, like, Craig, did you think about X, Y, or Z? Like, that might be an issue. Like, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I totally didn't think about that. And that could save you 100 hours of development, you know, in three months mm, because you mm. thought of this thing. So I think that is, that's really good um, advice. Obviously, not everybody can afford a super expensive uh, developer to start. But I think that's also, it's interesting to hear how you funded, um, you funded the development of, your podcast hosting platform with your productized service, which to me yep. is very interesting because I've always thought about, well, maybe my next thing will be software because I'm interested in doing that. I've never done anything like that before. And I think it would be definitely be a cool next adventure. And I run a productized service too that is somewhat profitable and could fund something yep. else. So I'm actually glad I'm talking to you. This is a, a this is good for me. Uh, so I'm selfishly like, yes, this is yeah. uh, maybe I'm on the right path here. Um, yeah. I just, I'll say it's a great, it's a great path. Um, it's a great, uh, privatized services are a great business model, as you know, because you can just stand up a WordPress site, connect it to Stripe and be profitable on the first day. Yeah. Um, as opposed to software where, I mean, we were building for six months um, and that's just cash out. And then even once you, once you've built it, you're not really profitable for, years you know yeah. i think anybody who has a, a software product would be lying to you if they said they were actually a profitable business in the first two years um there are exceptions yeah. but not a lot <sighs> totally um yeah we were not we were not super super profitable when we were not scaled productized services mm. i think are one of those one of those things where when you only have a few customers when you only have 10 or 20 customers you're using that as learning. You're using that to become more efficient to, to, to in order to scale up because a lot of the profit margin of product size service comes in having really good systems and being really efficient in your work. And because it is a service, right? It's not a product that's, you know, you can make 10 times as much, uh, you, you know, margins yep. probably are not as good on a product size service. So you have to help those margins out by being really efficient uh, with your systems. And that's a lot of what we worked on in early days. And now that, it's much better today, right? Than it is three was three years ago. Yeah, we can service you know hundreds of you know six, seven, eight hundred websites now with really good systems, and it has become much much more profitable now than it was early days. So I totally mm. hear you mm. on that. Um, yep. One other thing I wanted to touch on today was Tiny Seed, which is something I think. I think at some point I knew I was, we were talking before we started recording. I was like, I, I thought, I think I, I saw that you were part of tiny seed or the, the, the tiny seed accelerator at some point, but then I think I forgot it. And then I was looking at call notes and I was like, Oh, tiny seed, you're part of the tiny seed accelerator. Yeah. Now I remember. Yep. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about like, I guess how, what it's like to be part of the accelerator, but what I'm really interested in is your decision also to join the tiny seed accelerator, because I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that as a productized service, you were probably like a bootstrapped company or a revenue funded company before. Uh, yep. And this is, this may be, maybe it's not your first venture into an accelerator or into some sort of funding for the company, but I would be interested to hear what that 
decision to make that transition was like? Because I know a lot of people listening to this podcast are agency owners, maybe uh, people who own uh, plugins or themes or some piece of software or getting into software. And, you know, that's kind of your two options, right? It's like you, I can bootstrap it and build it, you know, with small revenue over time, or I can do something like join an accelerator. Uh, and I think in some cases, an accelerator is actually a really good option for folks as opposed to bootstrapping, depending on, you know, where you are or what experience you have and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I'd be interested yeah. to hear just kind of like what the decision tree was like in your mind when thinking about joining Tiny. Yeah. 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 I mean, that the, there obviously is a, a ton that goes into it. Um, the, I think, first of all, I've known Rob Walling uh, and Einar Volset, the two kind of principal partners there for kind of a long time. So I trust them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think anytime that you're giving up a part of your company for some cash, that for me is the most important thing is like, you have to have a hundred percent alignment of your goals and theirs, and you have to trust the people to not screw you. There's all sorts of legal stuff in place to to help prevent that. But at the end of the day, I think you you need to to like and trust the people that you're uh, that you're going into partnership with. And so I did. And so um, really, the decision for us, and 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 I'll try to make it kind of applicable to to a lot of folks, is um, we were already kind of decently far down the path. Like Castos was. Doing Ten or twelve thousand dollars MRR when we joined Tiny Seed, um, and that is mm. quite a bit later than a lot of the companies in the first batch. So they're in the about the middle of the second batch now. Um, that's a, you, know, you were in the first year. batch. Yeah, we were in the first batch, and so mm -hmm. it's a year long program. Uh, we started May of two thousand nineteen and ended May of this year. Um, second batch just started a few months, um, but we were pretty far along. Um, in, in terms of revenue when we joined, I think that number is about right um, in terms of revenue. But, you know, had like a full-time developer, I was paying myself. And I think we had someone on that was helping with support. But what joining Tiny Seed, I thought, would do for us is help us kind of live in the future, right? Like, and they, that's all it does is that, you know, you give up a percentage of your company to get a bunch of money or a little bit of money, however you want to look at it. Um and for us, since we kind of had a degree of product market fit, we had revenue, we were profitable, even though we wanted to, you know, go do more stuff. This is for me, the podcasting space is really dynamic right now. And there's a lot of stuff going on. You see uh, Spotify buying Anchor and Gimlet and who knows what's going to happen with this and that. Uh, and you see Joe companies Rogan like Simplecast. Well. <laughs> yeah, Joe Rogan since then and Simplecast going and raising a whole boatload of money. But I looked at this and said, podcasting is a really dynamic industry right now. I would rather take a bet on accelerating our growth, you know, taking this money to hire someone for marketing, do some paid acquisition um, experiments, try to grow much faster than we could organically uh, to, to kind of solidify our space in the market because it's growing so quickly. And that's really why to say like we wanted we hired a full-time marketer we brought one of our developers on full-time from part-time and we gave our marketing person i think a really strong budget to to play with for the kind of company that we were and mm. um yeah as a result we we've grown quicker than we were before and uh we have come back into peaks of profitability and um, and so that's, that's a whole nother discussion is like these peaks and valleys of profitability. And it's like this, there's this line of revenue, right. And there's profitability that goes over it and then it goes below it and it goes over it and it goes below it. And for us, like we, we don't try to be a profitable company. Um, but we try to grow as fast as possible. And, and I think those two things are, you can't optimize both of them to, to the fullest extent at the same time. Yeah. I totally would agree with that. I want to actually come back to that point of profitability because I totally want to talk about it. But I also, I want to touch on your point of like, why do something like join an accelerator? Why potentially raise funding? I'm not just talking about like raising $200 million from VC funding. I'm talking about like maybe there's angel funding out there who wants to, you know, maybe it's $100,000 in funding to accelerate a little bit. Um, yep. There's this trade-off between being bootstrapped and funding it yourself and, and doing something like an accelerator, which is you can do it yourself, grow organically, probably grow a little bit more slowly, have slower growth. That's what WP Buffs has done over 
five years, um, going on six years now, slow mm. and steady growth. This year was the first growth or the first time it's really started to, you know, rep, uh, be represented more by a hockey stick than it has by just like a linear growth. Um, and it's just cause we kind of eventually hit this point of, Oh, like we're kind of here now and established, yeah. but yeah. maybe I could have done that after two years had I joined an accelerator, but the trade-off I get is, you know, I give away a little bit of more control over my company, which is why, of course, what you're talking about, trusting the folks you're working with, super important. Um, but I'm uh, I'm interested in that, that point about looking at your industry and the podcasting industry and saying, like, I want to get ahead of, of where things are going to be in two years or three years and establish myself now. And that will give me an advantage as this space continues to grow. So I think what you're saying is you're putting a pretty significant bet on the podcasting space continuing to grow and having Castos at the forefront or near the forefront of this industry so that in two years, when the industry continues to grow even more rapidly, Castos will be one of the big options for folks to come and host their website or excuse me, to host their podcast, to have their podcast well-produced, all of this stuff. And that is a signifier of, that may be a signifier of if you should do something like join an accelerator. Are you in an area that you think will be growing in in the near future and will moving faster and being more established in your space really pay even bigger dividends in a year, in two years, in five years? Is it? Did I do, do you think I got that pretty right? Yep. Yeah, I, th- I think that you, you got it exactly right. And the, the thing I would add to the industry growing is the industry changing too. Um, because... Mm. Well, I mean, the, the the general WordPress plugin space is is one of those, right? You have uh, you have theme companies buying plugins, you have plugin companies uh, groups, you know, buying up a bunch of plugins to kind of aggregate under one brand. I would say the the general kind of WordPress plugin space, you could look at the same way right now, saying like, there's just a lot of movement there. Um, yeah. Is it growing? Not the same thing as I think of podcasting, but like there's a lot of stuff going on, right? With plugins right now that if you're a growing and profitable plugin, there are people that want to buy your business. To me, if you're kind of forecasting ahead to a, a scenario like that, you say, you look at, okay, if I took $100,000 or 500000 could I in the next two years be at a place that is so much better than if I did this by myself? And that's, that's the, we said yes to that. And that's the reason we joined. Yeah, yeah, I, t- I totally get that. And like I'm on Castos, the Castos website, I'm just, just castos.com. And when I think about like innovating into the future, um, like another reason we got introduced is because Matt Medeiros, who does some work with Castos, he messaged me on Twitter and he was like, hey, like you should totally switch over to Castos hosting. And I remember being like, I host on Libsyn right now, which is another hosting provider. Uh, honestly, like I'm not a huge fan of Libsyn. I'm like, it hosts my podcast. Like it does, I guess that, and that's cool. And I don't like really need to switch over right now to Castos, but I come to your website and I see like, okay, I can host the website. There's this audiogram and YouTube integration. I can do built-in transcriptions. There's a podcast editing service. So it's not just hosting. It's like everything around podcasting I could need so that I could pretty much sit down and just like record awesome episodes with awesome people. And then my podcast gets like like everything else is taken care of. And I think to me, when I think of like innovation in that space, that's a really cool direction to go in uh, because it's it's innovating in this way that like no matter what you need around podcasting, like Castos can handle it. It's not just hosting. So uh, when I think about switching over to Castos, I'm like, well, now I kind of am more interested because it's not just... Uh, it's you know it's not just uh, hosting; it's also a whole lot of other things. So I did want to come back to what you were mentioning about profitability as well, um, because that's something that I've found extremely interesting as a business owner myself in control profitability versus growth. Um, it's a challenge, and it's not something I ever really thought of before it like started happening. Um, and like, let me, I guess, give an example. So, at, like WP Buffs, um, when we did our, we did a big rebrand, a new website, and revamped a lot of our marketing materials and stuff. And we saw like huge growth in those two months after um, 
after we launched uh, or relaunched, which was awesome. And then in like the three months since then, we've like broken even the past three months. We mm. haven't been profitable. We haven't had a big loss either. But I, the thing I want to get across is that it was actually like strategic. We are putting a lot of that profit margin back into the business. We've made a lot of hires. We've hired like a people ops and HR person. We've hired a new sales person. Uh, yeah. I hired a head of growth. So I think it's very interesting in this, like you can be profitable. And it, a lot of times you're actually probably going to be more profitable as a smaller company than a bigger company, especially when you're going through these like times if I have to hire a lot of new people and stuff like that. Um, and it sounds like it, it, you've been through something similar over at Castos. It sounds like you've, you know, are going through this, this accelerator. I'm not sure if that actually raised funds for you or if you just, you know, gave part of your company in order to like get, you know, be part of this, um, of this cohort of folks. Um, but I'd love you to talk a little bit more about like the profitability versus growth thing. Cause it, you mentioned that and it sounds like you've at least gone through something similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we did get money from tiny seed. So we got $120,000 for a percentage of the company. Uh, and with that, we hired, you know, I mentioned we hired a full-time marketer, brought one of our developers up to full time. Uh, yeah. and, and honestly just had a lot of money in the bank that, that is still there. Um, we didn't, we didn't use, um, we didn't use half of the money basically. So we kind of dipped down in profitability, spent money, burned for a while, and then came back up uh, to break even and then profitable for a long time. And now we're dipping down into profitability again because, yeah, because uh, the way I look at it is um, from a personal perspective, we have savings in the bank uh, as more than, than I really want to have. I mean, that's a silly thing to say, but like that money is not doing me any good just sitting in the bank. Uh, mm -hmm. making, you know, 0.1% or whatever. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in the stock market and traditional, uh, you know, <laughs> financial instruments like that. And My so Robin I look account, at, yeah, it's, like, it's a mess. I shouldn't even look at it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so I look at like from a, um, from a, from two perspectives or like one, like stability of a company, um, the, the most time hopefully is behind us, right? When we're just me and Jonathan and we're trying to figure stuff out and it's a disaster all the time. It happens now, right? Uh, so, so we're about to be three developers, a full-time support person, two full-time marketing and success people and myself, plus someone to run our services business. And so we're like a real company now. Um, and, and so I think that it's much more stable because we've been able to invest a lot of money back into the company. The other thing is if we were profitable, you have to say like, what would you do with that money, right? So like if we didn't invest back in hiring more people to continue to make the company more solid and have it be more value, whatever metric you say, you have to say like, would you just take that money out and pay yourself a lot of money as the founder? Um, you certainly could. And there are people that do that and that's not wrong. But for me, I say like, our company has like a value today. And if I can dump every extra dollar that the company makes back into the company getting bigger, then that value will be much higher in the future. And and so yeah. that's how I look at at paying myself because as opposed to the stock market or certainly traditional savings accounts and things like that, a company is a really great asset to own. And as much as I can invest, which is basically what I'm doing by not paying myself more than I need, um, I'm, I'm the money of the company back in the end of the company. Yeah, I, I have totally the same mentality. Every like every six months, probably our COO, who also is like pretty involved in HR. Like I mentioned, we just hired an HR person who's like taking on all of our HR and people op stuff. Amazing, yeah. but Nick's very involved in that world as well. And he like every six months is like, you kind of give yourself a raise, Joe. Like this is like kind of <laughs> like, why why not? Because my salary is like the same as our COO salary, which is the same as our head of customer success's salary. We're all kind of in leadership, but like, that's how it is. And I think a lot of people assume like I must make like as pretty significant salary because I'm the CEO, but it's like totally not true. Um, but my value comes in like, like if I think about the salary I give myself and I like, you know, add 50% of that and I add it back into the company, it's actually like, that's good for me too, because my business is growing itself 
Uh, and honestly, like that's what I want to put my like that's I I I want to run a business not only that is successful but that is like a good business that like people enjoy working at and that like can provide good perks for people. You know, we're doing we're doing like four hundred one k now, which is like exciting. Awesome. We've never like yeah. done that before, right? And now it's like we can offer people an incentive to stay here for their careers, which to me is like, oh my God, this is totally, yep. I thought this was like a job for people, but like this could actually be a career for people. People want to like save for their retirement. Whoa, people could retire from WP Buffs like that is mm-hmm. so crazy. Yep. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm totally with you on the like, well, salary is, I think like Jeff Bezos's salary is like, it's something ridiculously low, like $120,000 a year. So it's like <laughs> clearly the richest, you know, the one of the, or the richest man in the world has such a low salary. Salary does not necessarily dictate like net worth, like, or yeah. maybe doesn't even have any real correlation with it. Right. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask in terms of, so raised 120 K from tiny seed, um, maybe raised isn't the right word, but accepted 120K to be part of the accelerator. Um, I don't know the exact language behind that. I'm just, I guess, trying to be careful about my language. Uh, Spent about half of it, you know, growing the team, dipping a little bit into profitability. How comfortable are you with the business, um, like being, like not getting into trouble, I guess, because the value for me in having, a little bit of money in the bank is are things like a rainy day fund are things like, well, what, like <clears throat> what preparing for the almost unpreparable, like what if something happens and we lose, you know, a 30% of our customers overnight, I'm pretty comfortable in WP buffs. I'm pretty sure the likelihood of that happening is super small, but that could also save the business that rainy day fund, if that is to happen. Um, so when you think about like the money you have left in the bank, are, is that what you're preparing it for? Or are you already thinking like, what else could I use it for in terms of growth? Yeah. So uh, I, I think that it's funny, understanding the profitability of a business is really hard because it's super dynamic, right? Even within a month, you say like, oh, we're going to hire somebody like we have a new developer coming on in two weeks. Um, like what I think our profitability is is going to change and not just what their salary is, but their salary plus benefits, plus taxes, plus all the other shit that we have to do. Mm -hmm. So like, first of all, I'm not like, it's not my strong suit, but I think really understanding the profitability of business is really hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable. I kind of have loose loose rules of thumb for me, which is I want to have three months of salary of our team's salary in the bank. And like the the greater of either of these two, three months of salary or 12 months of our burn rate. So if we get down to being kind of cash flow negative, 12 months of whatever that amount is. Yeah. Um, because yeah, things like COVID showed us that like you you don't know what what you might need money for. Uh, yeah. And COVID didn't affect our businesses. In fact, it, we, it accelerated them. But what's the next thing? What's the next COVID that yeah. negatively affects remote work and people who do digital stuff? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's how we think about it. So when we get above either of those, I say, okay, it's time to open the faucet. We need to you know, hire a developer, hire a marketing person, hire a support person. Um, and, and so, yeah, and that's how it goes. So, and I think it, when I talk to people that have much bigger businesses than us, those, those swings or the leverage that, that reinvesting in the business just get bigger. Um, so mm-hmm. you, you say, instead of hiring one person, you know, like you did, you can go hire three or four people in this month or this quarter. And as a result, you're going to be, you know, break even or maybe burning a little bit, but then you're going to be so much more profitable. So I think those, those jumps, uh, the, the little that we've seen in talking to my friends that run, you know, 30 or 50 people companies, the, those jumps just get bigger. And if we're able to keep investing in the company, we're going to do it as long as we can. Yeah. Uh, totally agree. We, we just, we just kind of, finally after like five years reached our like we have three months of like full-time like funding if we didn't make a single other penny in the bank uh and so that was like big it's awesome it yeah. feels like it took a long time yeah totally awesome and it, it feels like it took a long time but that's just kind of how it is like it's uh, our business is actually pretty comfortable like there's pretty much no way we could lose 30% of our business overnight. Like it's pretty improbable. So I never felt super uncomfortable having like one month when we were at one month salary or two months, et cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a nice milestone to hit it. It for sure is like, 
it it adds a de stressor for me as a business owner. That's mm. like huge. Uh, yeah, things could go totally sideways, and like we could figure it out. And that's that's <laughs> that's great for me. Uh, and being yeah. able to sleep. Um, yeah. The, yeah. What last kind of thing before we kind of start wrapping up that I wanted to talk about was <sighs> this new marketer that you have. Um, I'm a marketer. That's my background: digital marketing, SEO, content stuff. Um, I'm not super technical, tactical or tech te technical. Like I don't know how to do like a product hunt launch or like so, like some of those like specific marketing things. But like SEO, content, growing traffic, like those are kind of things I'm pretty experienced in. Um, yep. We just hired a new head of growth. Um, you have a new marketer on the team. I'd love to hear a little bit more about like your process of bringing someone on for growth and to help grow the company. Cause I think that's a, it was always a hard thing for, for me. I always, I always, I've, I've hired a couple marketing people in the past. It didn't work out too well. Our new head of growth is great. Uh, and he's been doing an awesome job. Um, I'd be interested to hear like maybe some like good things or things you maybe feel like you need to work on in terms of like new hires around growth. Cause I feel like it is a, it's kind of a, it's a more complex hire than I think people give it credit for. It sounds easy. Like hire someone to like mm. do the things to like grow the business, but it's really not that easy. You have to really get to know the business. You have to understand the customers. You have to understand the pain point. You have to understand the industry. You have to understand a lot yeah. of things in order to hit the right levers, especially in like a value driven way. That's, that's, that's good for folks. That's not like, you know, trying to hack into the uh, process. Um, but yeah, I'd love to yeah. learn a little bit more about like your hiring of a marketing person and how that's how that's gone so far. Yeah, yeah. So, so we you alluded to to us hiring Matt Maderos, who is just at two months on the job now, and Matt's title <laughs> is director of podcaster success, which uh, is a little bit of a marketing right. It's it's success is like retention and conversion. Um, for people being more successful on the platform. So, so to a degree, it's a marketing role. And, and you know Matt, Matt's probably been on the podcast here. He's a marketer, right? He's a sales guy. Like it's where he's happiest, but he's also a really good podcaster. So that's that's what I've known him for a while. And that's what drew him to the team and me to him was it's a perfect fit. He he fills that part of the role that I had been been serving as the founder is to podcasting with folks a lot. Um our first hire in marketing is uh, was Denise Smeckel. So she came on pretty much right after we joined Tiny Seed, and she is um, she is a really good kind of all round marketer. So she comes from a, a background in more of like direct to consumer or B two C market, mm -hmm. which was uh, something that I wanted because I very much am a B two B kind of person. Um, we talk a lot about. Um, you know, between Matt and Denise and I, like being able to think about and think like a lot of different types of our customers. And you, you can probably relate, like you have mm -hmm. a lot of different types of customers. And I think that a place that a lot of market to trouble with is, you know, they come from a background or a set of experiences, and that makes them think about the product or the space in a way. <laughs> and doing that alienates 80% of the market. And mm -hmm. so we we kind of purposely want to try to bring in a really diverse and wide variety of types of people into our into all of our company, but especially marketing. Um, but but the way that that so so hire Denise, a lot of the decision of who to hire and, and her in particular is the same for a marketer or a developer. The first mm -hmm. thing is like trust and communication and like give a shit factor, you know? And I hate to make it that simple, but that's really like so much of it, oh, right? I mean, it's right. just like, yeah. does this person, does this person really care? You know, do they really, really care that if I say, look, I want to grow organic traffic by 20% every month, that they are going to stress over that. You know, I don't put a lot of stress on people, but we have goals and we're very transparent about those. And I want someone to be able to say, okay, this is, this is my, you know, my weight, I, I need to carry this. And, and so a lot of it is just trying to figure that out. And, and someone that, that we, there's the company can talk to in a very open and constructive way. And for them to understand what we're trying to say, and then translate that into action. Um, and, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm kind of answering and kind of not answering your question, but, but that's, that's how we think about like who to bring on and, and how, and how to onboard them is, and it makes me, it makes 
feel like a, you know, this big kind of CEO person, but a lot of it's just like vision of like, we want to build the absolute best podcasting platform out there. That's, that's like the really big picture thing. And from there, we try to drill down into like the different disciplines and what folks are doing, but remembering that. And, and so it, it translates to, you know, support and success and marketing and product and development. Um, and then from there it gets more specific, but yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of like tactically, the one, the one thing I definitely did right with both Matt and Denise is create like a 30, 60 and 90 day plan um, and shared it with them. And, and I took this from the folks at Drift that they write their job description um, after they have these 30, 60, 90 day plans. So they say like, I want to hire a person for marketing. At 30 days, I want them to be able to do this, this and this. And after 60 days, I want them to be able to kind of own and manage this and this. And 90 days, the same thing. And then they go, right, then that's the job description is in this role. You will blah, 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 blah. And you will have ownership over these areas. And then we check in on those twice a week um, for the first month. So we have twice a week calls to say, okay, this is kind of the goalpost. How are you doing? What do you need my help with to, to get there and be successful? Resources, education, background, uh, you know, training, things like that. So, so I mean, that's kind of the, the rough outline of, of how we try to structure things again, so that people can be successful. Because I think that that's my experience. The times when people have not been successful, a lot of it comes back to me just doing a bad job of defining what that means. You know, like uh, if you can't say this is what success looks like, then you can't expect anybody to, to actually be successful. Uh, and so I think as, as founders or leaders, that's, that's a big part of what we need to do up front, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just wrote down that 30, 60, 90 day plan and also having that part of the job description. I think all of that's really smart. That's probably the biggest thing I've changed is like really being really explicit about expectations and goal setting and just making sure people understand like where they need to be at certain times. Um, I don't think I do it this explicitly though. So I really like this idea of just having it be like one month out, two months out, three months out. Um, the one other thing I wanted to to note of what you said was, and I've said this multiple times on this podcast, listeners are probably like, yes, we've heard this before, but building a business <laughs> is all about overcoming challenges Every business is going to run into challenges. The businesses that survive, they just overcome challenge after challenge and they like are still around, right? Uh, and you were just talking about like give a shit factor, which I think is super important, but also just having people from a lot of different backgrounds of knowledge. Um, you're really at, at core talking about just like having a really diverse team. And I think that's a really like um, really tangible positive outcome of having a really diverse team you know there are people out there they're like team diversity like whatever or like you just hire the smartest people for the role but it's the diversity has enormous benefits and it allows you to overcome challenges because one person with a diver, more diverse background or one person with a different background than people who are already on your team come at things from a different viewpoint and they may be able to pinpoint something that the rest of your team couldn't see not because they're not skilled enough to do it just because they come from a different background. So this is a super tangible, like diversity really adds to your ability to solve problems and overcome challenges, which is all building successful businesses, right? Of course, there's other factors, good ideas, execution, but every successful business ever in the history of the world and all of business overcame a bunch of challenges to get to where they are at any given time. So um, yeah. I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. Um, but I appreciate you saying that. I think that is super spot on. Um, let's wrap yeah. up. I, I want to know where people can uh, find you online. I don't know if you do social media, but shoot, uh, tell people you know where they can find you and your website and all the stuff you do. Yeah, absolutely. So castos.com is the place to check out stuff about Castos and what we're doing there. Uh, I'll get craighewitt.me. Uh, less frequently than I would like to, but uh, yeah, I would love to connect with anybody. Anybody has podcasting questions, you know, shoot us a message at castos.com. Love to love to chat and help out however we can. Cool. And uh, last thing I like to ask our guests to do is ask our listeners here for a little five-star iTunes review for our show. So if you wouldn't mind asking folks for a little review, I'd appreciate it. All right. So listeners, get out your phone, your favorite podcasting app, swipe to the left. Is it swipe to the left or swipe to the right? Give a five-star review for WPMRR and leave a comment and say why you like and why you think other people would like it too.
Yes, appreciate it. Uh, and if people are leaving a little review, uh, leave a, a comment with it as well. Um, tell us something you learned from this episode. It helps us to know what other kinds of episodes we should do. We'll do more podcasting episodes. If we get some reviews about podcasting, I will also send it over to Craig for a uh, thank you to Craig. Oh, I'm on Craig Hewitt dot me right now looks like it's run on wordpress so nice job there's another wordpress course, wordpress yeah, collection for you. course um cool uh if you are a new listener to the show go through some old episodes this is going to be episode like 110 or something like that uh we've got 100 plus episodes in the bank uh about everything monthly recurring revenue wordpress some non-wordpress stuff some other podcasting episodes go back through some old uh episodes uh and do some binging on some content that'll actually help you grow your business uh itunes review talked about that awesome feel free to leave one uh wpmrr.com virtual summit is over virtual summit was last week craig we had a virtual summit last week it was awesome but it's over now awesome we are getting those videos up on youtube though so feel free to subscribe to wp buffs on youtube or just go to wpmrr.com there are a bunch of buttons on the home page that can send you to go and watch those videos you can subscribe if you want to and if not go ahead and you can get those videos for free anyway on youtube uh, until 2021 virtual summit um cool that is all for this week uh, we will be in your podcast players again next Tuesday. Craig, thanks again for being on, man. It's been real. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it.